This is the second video about learning quantum mechanics from scratch. And in the last video, we talk about light and polarization of light and how to deal with that in quantum mechanics. So today, we're going to be talking about the spin of electrons. And we're going to explain how we know that electrons have this thing called spin. And then we're going to talk about the mathematics of how to deal with that spin. So if you remember, there were three rules of quantum mechanics that we met last time. We're going to apply those same three rules to this system and understand how they work here. Hopefully having a second example will just make your understanding of those rules a little bit richer. There's one piece of classical electromagnetism that we're gonna need for this video, and it is a really deep and surprising result from that theory, and it goes like this. Charged particles, like this negative electron moving around, causes magnetic fields. This is an insanely deep and beautiful result from classical electromagnetism. That's why it's called electromagnetism, because it showed that electricity and magnetism are not really different things. They're actually kind of the same things. A charged particle moving is what causes magnets. Now, this is an important result, but it was known by the time that people were coming up with quantum mechanics, and so, of course, it was baked into quantum mechanics. We'll very soon see that in quantum mechanics, electrons are not described as point particles like I like to draw them. They're actually more like waves, very similar to light waves, they're spread out in space. And this is true even when they're inside of an atom. Instead of a single point particle rotating around the atom, you have this cloud of electron all around all the time. But even though it is this wave that's spread out, it still has this thing called angular momentum. So angular momentum in classical mechanics is what you get when something is rotating and electrons around the atom do have angular momentum. And so using what we just learned about electromagnetism, we would expect that this electron that has some angular momentum around this atom also does produce an electric field. And that is correct in quantum mechanics. So far, so good. But spin is different. Spin wasn't originally baked into quantum mechanics because people didn't expect it to happen. It doesn't seem to arise from the motion of an electron in the same way that the angular momentum around the atom does. It seems to be an intrinsic angular momentum. When physicists first encountered a type of angular momentum that electrons have that couldn't be accounted for by the electron going around in circles, they modeled it this way. Imagine this electron is a lot like the spinning Earth. There's an axis of rotation and the electron spins about there. If this electron really does have some physical extent like this, this it really is the same as a charged particle moving in a circle. Imagine that this is the bird's eye view of this same electron, right? And it's spinning around this axis. That means that if we looked at any little piece of this electron, say this piece, then what happens to it over time? Well, it spins in this circle, it goes around. And so that means that this is a case where you have a charged piece of material moving in a circle. That means that this should create a magnetic field. In fact, a really important result about charged particles like this with physical extent that are rotating around is that their magnetic field looks a lot like a bar magnet. So the magnetic field of a bar magnet will look something like this, sort of like the magnetic field of Earth actually, which now that I think about it, isn't unrelated since the magnetic field of Earth is also created by charged particles inside of the Earth rotating. That's kind of cool. So yeah, you get this kind of magnetic field from both objects. This is something that I got wrong in my original What Is Spin video that I corrected later, but I feel like I want to correct here as well. These two things are very, very similar, like their magnetic fields are almost identical, but there is a big difference between them. This has angular momentum. This does not. This is just a magnet sitting there. This has angular momentum. The angular momentum does make a difference because the results we're about to see of the Stern-Gerlach machine do not happen unless you have angular momentum. 
So the Stone Gerlach experiment involves this massive magnetic setup where these two things are magnets with a very particular magnetic field. And then you shoot electrons down this path and then you measure where they end up on the back wall. So this back wall is able to detect where an electron landed. So what do we expect to happen if we have a charged particle that's spinning on its own axis? Well, a charged particle like this, that's spinning around this axis, can have that axis aligned in many different ways, forward, backwards, like this, like that, and all of those ways will have slightly different results. If the magnetic moment happens to line up with the direction of this stone gerlach machine, then the electron will be pushed upwards very strongly, and so it'll go more up and up until it reaches the back wall quite high up. So in that case, it would end up here. But if the magnetic moment was lined up so it was in the opposite direction, then it would be pushed down very strongly and it would eventually land quite far down. On the other hand, if the moment was aligned perpendicular, so just flat, then it would not feel any force at all, which kind of makes sense. It's like halfway between feeling a force upwards and feeling a force downwards. So it just feel no force at all and it would end up in the middle. Now, of course, there's many other orientations that this could have. So if it was a little bit like this, then you would expect that instead of feeling no force, it would feel a little bit of force, but not enough to make it go all the way up here. It would just be enough to get somewhere in between. So this magnetic moment and similarly for that magnetic moment. And by the way, it could of course also be aligned this way so that it's completely flat in the other direction. This would also just re result in it like ending up sort of here because it doesn't feel any force up or down. It only matters for this stone gallic machine how up or down the orientation is. It doesn't really matter how into the page or out of the page it is. So this machine is just measuring how much is the magnetic moment of this charged particle pointing up or down. Now physicists imagined that electrons would act a lot like they were spinning on their own axes. And so if we do this stone gerlach experiment, we know what to expect. Well, since these axes would probably be all randomly aligned, you know, there's just as much chance that you would end up going upwards as you would downwards and everything in between. And so you would expect that when you put these electrons through this machine, they would all just sort of end up spread out, something like that. But that, of course, isn't what happened. What actually happened is that maybe the first electron went all the way to the top. And then the next may have ended up all the way at the bottom. Well, that's a bit of a coincidence, but let's keep going. Then the next one might have also ended up exactly at the same spot, right at the bottom. And maybe the next one ended up right at the top. And then another one at the top. So you end up with the electrons grouping up into just two spots. The first spot aligning with all of the electrons having the maximum spin up or all of them having the maximum spin down, and there is nothing in between. That seems really, really odd. By the way, I hope this sounds a little bit reminiscent of the polarization of light. The actual light can have any polarization whatsoever. And yet, as we talked about in the last video, if the light is very, very weak and you measure it in the horizontal or the vertical direction, you'll find that a single photon of light will either get through or it won't. So in other words, it's like it had polarization that was exactly aligned with the horizontal or exactly aligned with the vertical and nothing in between, even though the original light here actually wasn't fully aligned with horizontal or vertical. It's kind of just like these electrons. It's not the case that the electrons happen to have magnetic moment exactly facing up or down. They could have had all kinds of momentum but when they go through here, it's like the measurement forces them to choose. Do they want to be fully up and do they want to be fully down?
In fact, mathematically at least, these two systems are almost identical. And actually not just in mathematics. Recently, I realized that uh, polarization of light is actually a type of spin. That blew my mind and I'm not gonna talk about it here because I think that that result requires a little bit more machinery to be able to prove. But we are going to see how mathematically these two things look extremely similar and it is suggestive of their relationship. Just quickly, I wanna discuss whether electrons really are spinning on their own axis like this. I mean, this was the interpretation of the stone girl -like experiment at the start, but afterwards people started questioning it. So one of the reasons I've heard people question it is that electrons should be point particles. They don't have like physical extent, they're infinitely small. And so how can they spin around? I don't know where that's coming from, to be honest. I don't think that quantum mechanics says at all that electrons are point particles. In fact, in quantum mechanics, electrons are fairly spread out. But I still don't think that that explains spin. So it's not like because the electron is spread out into a ball like this, and then the, that ball rotates, there is this thing called spin. The reason why I say that is because the spin of an electron, so how much of this intrinsic angular momentum it has, is unrelated to how spread out its quantum wave function is. So even if it's a really big wave or if it's a very small wave, uh, it doesn't really affect its spin. It always has the same amount of spin. It's just the direction of that spin that's allowed to change. So then it doesn't make sense for the spin of an electron to be a result of how spread out the electron is and how that stuff is moving around in space. That actually just goes straight into the angular momentum, which remember does exist in quantum mechanics. There is just regular old angular momentum for electrons and electrons can have it when they're going in circles, like when they're going around an atom. But this intrinsic spin is completely unrelated to what the electron is doing in space. And so that's what makes me think it truly is a different property to angular momentum and it probably doesn't represent a ball spinning. Let's do an experiment with electrons that's very analogous to what we did with light in the last video. So I'm gonna start all of these electrons off with their magnetic moment facing down. Well, how do we actually prepare all of our electrons like that? Well, to prepare the electrons in this state, all we need to do is get a stern gerlach machine and send these electrons down the machine. Now, half of them are going to get pulled upwards and half of them are gonna get pulled downwards. Now, all we do is we discard the ones that went down and we just keep the ones that went up. And now, because of the post-measurement rule, we can be sure that their state is up. This is really similar to how we prepare light of a particular polarization. This filter here is cutting out all of the light that didn't go in the right direction. So everything that comes out is horizontally polarized. All right, let's keep going. Now we have these electrons that are gonna go along and they're gonna meet now a second stern gerlach machine. But this machine is going to be oriented in a different direction. It's not oriented up and down. Instead, it's oriented left and right. And so now the electrons again have to choose whether to go left or to go right. Remember that for a stern gerlach -like machine, the electrons can't just choose to go right through the middle. They either have to go to the left or to the right. And so 50% of them will go either way. And the reason it's 50-50 is because if you imagine an electron that's oriented down like this, it has no particular bias towards left or right. And so both of those are sort of equally as good. And so half of them go both ways. And again, we are going to discard the ones that didn't go the way we wanted. So we're just gonna keep the ones that went right. And so now we know these electrons are all oriented to the right. This is really similar to if we did this experiment with light and we did a measurement at 45 degrees. Similar to the electrons, the light has a 50-50 chance of going through this measurement. And finally, these electrons go through one last stern gerlach experiment. And it's the exact same experiment that they did right at the start. And remember, these electrons were the same ones that ended up 
downwards when we did that stone garlic experiment at the start. So you would think that if we repeat the exact same measurement again, that they should all end up down. But before I reveal the answer, let's review the case with light first to see what light did. If we put in this measurement right at the start, it cuts out all of the light. So this measurement is the same as this one, just in the perpendicular direction. So remember for light, similar to the stone Gerlach experiment, there's always two different directions that the light can go. So whenever you put in a filter at a certain direction, a certain fraction of the light will go through. And if you had instead put the filter at 90 degrees to that, then one minus that fraction would have gone through. So what I mean is this, here we have prepared the light to be horizontal. And so all of the light should go through if we try and do another horizontal measurement. You can see that doesn't affect the amount of light going through at all. That means that if we were to do vertical, it almost fully cuts out the light. It should be fully, but these are not perfect. This measurement is like the same measurement as that. It's just the other outcome. So I'm gonna put this measuring device here and you know, it should cut out all the light. It kind of does. Now, what do you think will happen if I lift this up? You might remember this result from last time, but you see that in fact, more of the light went through than if you hadn't had it up. A very similar thing is gonna happen with the spin. Instead of these electrons acting the exact same way that the original electrons will have, they're actually going to act completely different. They're going to split 50-50. Half of them will end up at the top and half of them will end up at the bottom. Now this result, similar to in the light case, can only be explained by measurement collapse. To figure out what's going on in this experiment, we need to be able to talk about the quantum state of an electron with spin. First, let's deal with the easiest case. We have an electron that has already gone through a stern gerlach machine just now and ended up up. So we wanna represent this state as a quantum state. Remember our first rule of quantum mechanics is that every quantum state is a vector. So we need a vector that represents this state. Well, this case is fairly straightforward. Let us draw this vector that represents the state of this electron as this arrow and we're gonna call it up. Imagine that we put this electron through the stone Gerlach machine, and instead of getting the result up, the electron went downwards, and so this is in state down. How should we draw this state? So you might think that the best way to do it would be to draw it downwards, and that would make some sense. But actually what we're gonna do is to draw it this way. Why would we do that? That's because remember, this is a mathematical representation of the actual physical situation. And what we want to um, you know, encode in this representation is some relationships about these different states. So for example, up and down are opposite states to each other. When you do a stern gerlach experiment that's aligned in the up-down direction, each electron has to choose whether to go up or to go down. And it can't, you know, do both of those because they're completely orthogonal to each other. And so in that same way, we want them to be orthogonal in this representation. Think back to the light when we had a measurement basis like this. And what it meant was that either the light would be horizontally polarized or it would be vertically polarized. Any measurement would choose one or the other of these outcomes. And similarly, the stone gerlach experiment chooses either up or down. And so these two things should be orthogonal in our mathematical representation, even though it doesn't line up super well with the physical representation. Now we have a basis for this measurement. Remember, a basis is a set of vectors like this that are orthogonal to each other that represent all of the different possibilities of a particular measurement. 
So this particular measurement, this stern gerlach experiment, has two options, up and down. And now we can use that measurement basis to figure out what happens to any electron in any state when it goes through this measurement. So suppose I have a state that is perfectly in between these two states. This state is a superposition of both of these two states. So as we learned last time, the way to write this state that is at 45 degrees is it is one on square root two up plus one on square root two down. What is this state, by the way, physically with the electron? Which way is its magnetic moment pointing? Well, let's think about it. This state is like it's completely unbiased between both up and down. And so we can't have, you know, the magnetic moment pointing upwards or even a little bit upwards like this. That wouldn't make sense, right? Like this at 45 degrees, it's a little bit tempting to think it would be that. But actually, this is very biased towards up. And so it should most of the time end up going upwards. But that's not what we find. We want something that's completely unbiased between these two. And so really, it should be like this. The magnetic moment just points off to the right. So this state is the right state. And how do we find the probability that this state will go upwards? Well, we look at up and we look at the coefficient and we take the absolute value squared of it. So the probability of getting up is one on square root two squared, which is half. And the probability of getting down is one on square root two squared, which is also half. So this has a 50-50 chance of going upwards or downwards. But let's again revisit the other way of figuring out this probability. And it is gonna seem a little bit needlessly complicated, but it is really nice to know. It helps you later on when you wanna write things quickly and you don't wanna be doing loads of calculations. Like this way is probably the easiest way to be doing calculations and figuring out the probability, but the other way is kind of nicer for sort of thinking more philosophically about quantum mechanics. Of course, I should point out, they're both exactly the same when it comes down to it. It's just a slightly different perspective. The dot product rule for figuring out probabilities in quantum mechanics goes like this. If you want to know the probability of measuring a particular vector, so this quantum state, the right state, as up, when you measure up down, what's the probability it will go up? The way to do it is to first calculate the dot product or the inner product as it's also called. Take the modulus of it and then square it. The modulus bit, by the way, doesn't really matter for us at the moment because we're only dealing with the case where these coefficients are real numbers. If they were complex numbers, it would matter. But for now, we're not going to cover that complex case. I'll probably put that into an optional extra video because I think the complex bit doesn't really add too much to the interpretation. As long as these numbers can be positive and negative, I think you get most of the interesting quantum effects. But anyway, just so you know. So, okay, the modulus bit's not important, but how do you calculate this inner product? And what even is this inner product? What does it mean? Well, as I kind of alluded to before, it's a measure of how lined up these two vectors are. So this vector and that vector. How close are they together? Are they overlapping each other? In which case, this would be equal to one. Or are they perpendicular to each other? In which case, this would be zero. Or is it somewhere in between? In the previous video, I explained that the dot product of two vectors is cos of the angle between them. In this case, the angle is 45 degrees, and so the dot product is one on square root two, which is about 0.7. However, there's an even easier way to do the calculation when you already have an equation like we do. I want to show you how to do it so you get familiar with the maths of quantum mechanics. So let's calculate the dot product by just using this equation. So to calculate this, we're going to replace this right vector with the vector here, up, and then And the really convenient thing about the inner product is that it has this property called linearity, which means that 
instead of taking the dot product of this whole vector at once, it's okay for me to take the dot product of this with the first part and then this with the second part and then add them together. So in other words, this is the same as one on square root two. You can see that what happened here is that this up distributed, it's just like when you multiply by a number outside, it's like if you had five times uh, one plus three, that's the same as five times one plus five times three. And then you add them together. That's the same as if you had just done this addition first and then found the answer. So it's exactly the same way you have distribution here. This up distributes so that you can do those individual parts first and then add it up. The reason why that was a good idea is because, remember, we do know what the inner product is when the two vectors in question are orthogonal to each other or overlap with each other. In this case, it's the inner product of up with itself, so it overlaps. That's just equal to one. And this is the inner product of up with down. So because those are perpendicular to each other, that is zero. And that means that the overall answer for this is one on square root two. So putting that into here, we get our result as we would have expected. That this probability is equal to a half. Again, this might seem like a slightly tedious way to do the same calculation we've been doing already. And in fact, when it comes down to it, the calculation looks almost identical mechanically. But the only reason I'm trying to um, introduce you to this way of thinking about the Born rule is because I really like this interpretation of this probability being about how much the measurement vector overlaps with the state vector. So that probability is all about the angle between them. The more that the state vector overlaps with this measurement vector, the higher the probability is going to be. And the more perpendicular the state vector is, the lower the probability is going to be. So that's just a really nice way to think about probabilities in quantum mechanics. All right, so we figured out what to do with an electron that has its spin pointing to the right, um, but we're doing a up-down measurement. But what about if its spin was pointing to the left? Now, what does the state vector look like? Well, whatever the state is, we know that we can write it as a superposition of up and down. And all we need to figure out is what a and b equal. And we also know that the size of a and b should be one on square root two, because we know that if we were to do this measurement, that half of the time it should go up and half of the time it should go down. That's because the probability should equal to a half. So that means that these have to be one on square root two, but they can be positive or negative one on square root two. So which way is it? There's really not much difference between a state this direction and a state that direction. So this one here is a positive up and a negative down. And, and this one is a negative up and a positive down. But you can see that the hen result is that they're basically the same vector just flipped from each other. We could choose either, but I'm going to choose this one. And the reason is because it's kind of nice that this one is pointing a bit to the right and this one's pointing a little bit to the left. I mean, it doesn't actually really make a difference, but it just, it looks nicer this way. So let's define left to be positive up and a negative down. Okay, so there's one very last calculation I want us to do, and that is for us to figure out what would happen if an electron that is, let's say, in the up state was measured 
in the left-right basis. So remember, you can turn the stone girl like machine in any direction that you want. So it's perfectly fine for us to do a left-right measurement instead. So what is the probability that up will turn up to the left or it will go to the right? Well, for this, let's think about the dot product. And you'll see that there's quite a nice symmetry between the two situations. So the probability that I will measure the up state going to the right is to do with the angle between them and it's 45 degrees. Well, we've already calculated this and we know that this is one on square root two. And so the probability is if you take the absolute value of this and you square it, so that is a half, just like we'd expect. Similarly, if we wanted to find out the probability that this up state goes to the left, then we would have to calculate this, which again, we know must be one on square root two squared, because again, this is 45 degrees. The more interesting case is if the original state of this electron is down and we want to find out the probability that it goes left. So again, we're gonna to have to calculate this dot product. We know that the dot product between any two vectors that are 45 degrees away from each other is gonna be one on square root two. But what about if they're 135 degrees away from each other like these two are? Well, the answer is kind of nice and you'll be able to calculate this yourself if you're interested. But it turns out that the dot product of two vectors that are 135 degrees apart from each other is equal to negative one on square root two. But that's fine because we now have to take the absolute value. So when we do that, that just becomes a positive number. And then we have to square it. And this equals a half, which is what we expected. So now with all of that maths in hand, let's see if we can solve the original puzzle. Remember how it goes is we start off with a bunch of electrons in the state down. And then we put them through a stone gerlach machine that is oriented in the left-right direction. And then finally, we do another measurement that is the up-down measurement. So remember, our intuition was telling us that if this measurement wasn't there, then it would be completely clear what would happen in this measurement. All of the electrons end up downwards because they started off in this state down. And then the probability of down is the dot product of down with itself, which is one. But when we have this measurement in between, what goes wrong? Well, we're gonna do this measurement and we know that the probability that we'll get left or right is half. So half of them go in each direction. Then we throw away the electrons that didn't make it and we only keep those that went to the left. Now, what is the state of these electrons? Is it down or has it changed? Well, the whole key to understanding this is realizing that in quantum mechanics, measurement causes collapse. So after you've measured all of these electrons to be going to the right, their state is in fact different. The new state is right. This is completely different to what would happen in classical mechanics if we were to do an experiment with a stone gerlach machine and a classically spinning charged ball. We would find that this ball would either go upwards or downwards depending on which way its magnetic moment was oriented. But we would find that the measurement itself did nothing to that magnetic moment. It just keeps it exactly the same, but not so in quantum mechanics. After this measurement, this new state is right, which means that it's forgotten what it used to be. Now it is in this new state. And that is why we get the result here, which is that 50% of them go up and 50% go down, which makes sense because the probability of going up here is equal to the absolute value of the up vector, which is the one we're measuring, and right, which is the state of these electrons when they start this experiment. And that we've calculated to be a half. And so answer me this, the electrons that have gone up here, if we just look at those ones and we consider their state after this measurement, what is it gonna be? Is it gonna be right what it was previously? 
or is it going to be up now? It's going to be up, which is consistent with the measurement collapse rule, rule number three of quantum mechanics. Any time that you do a measurement, it is going to result in the new state of that um, quantum system to be aligned with the measurement vector of the outcome that you got. To summarize, let's go over the three rules of quantum mechanics and see how they applied in this situation. So first we had the superposition rule, which says that every state that the electron can have is some sort of vector. And we represented those vectors like this. So this was the up vector, this was down five degrees, this was right, and this was left. Next we had the Born rule for measuring probabilities and in this video we looked at the version of the Born rule which uses the dot product. It says that for example the probability of measuring up for the state right is that you take the inner product of these two vectors, doesn't matter which order, you take the absolute value of that and then you square it. And finally, you have the measurement collapse rule, which says that no matter what state that you started off with, if you end up getting the measurement result up when you did the up-down measurement, then the new state of that object is going to be up. All the rest of it just disappears and the state doesn't remember what it was before. Hopefully now these three rules of quantum mechanics are making a bit more sense. But if you want a bit more help and you would like to actually learn all of this quantum mechanics with a live cohort and tutorials and doing problems for homework, all of that, uh, there'll be a link in the description to more information about a live course. Thanks for watching.